class. Um, this is going to be a, a different discussion than what most of our discussions are as far as physical elements because it has so many different branches. And when we talk about addiction, we're going to be referring to uh, not only cause, we'll also talk about uh, correction. And in order to talk about either of those, we actually need to look at recognition. Uh, and then we will talk about the correction that we do in our office and the things that we utilize to help as far as support. Um, I'm just going to say right off, this is going to end up being, being a very Christian discussion. So if you're offended by that, yeah, now's the best time to <laughs> just realize this probably isn't where I should be. Um, because I have found that the 12-step the program that AA offers is a very, very helpful program. And if we use a model similar to that, um, there can be a lot of healing. Because it utilizes two key principles. One, a faith in God, that there is a higher power. And two, a mentor program. Because so many times addictions are so much about secrecy and shame that it requires a mentor or someone to hold a hand to get beyond that, okay? And one of the most important things in recognition is I can't do it alone, okay? It's not something that I can overcome by myself. I need some outside help. So one of my favorite references in, in the New Testament is from Mark 2.17. The whole hath no need for the physician. And when we're incomplete, we need the physician's help. And I believe that Really and truly, God is the greatest helper in this. And along that, we need a helper, a mentor, to help us to get through and coach through addictions. When we talk about addictions, let's just talk about, first of all, types of addictions. What are some addictions, when we say addiction, what are some types of addictions that um, we can be aware of? We don't necessarily have to, it's not confession time or anything like that, okay? Food. Foods, okay? So food is a very, very common addiction. And it's a difficult one, actually, to even acknowledge for many people because it is so powerful. Um, food, and along with foods, come then other pleasurable type things that go along with that, which include then sodas. And the addictive properties then, particularly of caffeine and sweeteners. Okay, so along with that, go then sweets and sweeteners. Okay, a lot of sweeteners create more addiction. So when you look at drinks like, and I'll use a couple of just general generalities, uh, energy drinks. Energy drinks are very addictive. Why? Because they have sweeteners and caffeine, and they also have different colorings or dyes in them that quickly tag whatever they're accompanying to the brain, especially red dyes. Red and blue dyes will cross the blood-brain barrier very quickly, and they'll tag with it whatever the carriers are. So it's not a coincidence that energy drinks have a color to them. Okay? They're not usually a clear water. All right. Um, what are some others? Addictions. Well, they can be all extremes. You can have anywhere from like sexual addictions to okay. even exercise or, I mean, it can, I think anything that's in excess okay. can be classified as an addiction. Okay, so work. What else is an addiction? Anybody else? Drugs and alcohol. Drugs and alcohol. So substances, right? And along with drugs then, also falls into the category of drugs, legal and illegal. So anything from prescription drugs to nicotine or cat and uh, tobacco products to other types of drugs that people use that are over-the-counter type things like Robitussin or cough suppressants, um, alcohols that are in NyQuil and those types of things that people use. 
fumes that people breathe like gasoline, okay? Whiteout, young people painting their fingernails with whiteout and just smelling whiteout, okay? <laughs> it's actually something they use to get a high. Did you know that even young people nowadays will break up, and I hope I'm not telling things to share things of, of uh, oh, I haven't tried that yet. <laughs> um, but young people actually take Smarties and break them up and then breathe the Smarties and the sugars in that and the dye in that Smartie actually causes spasm in the lungs and the bronchospasm creates a histamine release that's very, very neuroexciting. It's a neuroexcitatory response and they don't even realize that they're sucking in Smarties. Okay, so those little smarty candies. And that's, that's something else that's, and they don't even think, oh, it's funny, ha ha, ha ha, but they're actually doing something that is a chemical stimulation of the brain. Okay? Interesting, isn't it? Okay? And how subtle these different types of addictions and tricks actually can become. Okay? So when we look at that, that really, when we start to play on the word of addiction, okay, D-I-C-T is the root to dictate. What does it mean to dictate? Control. To control, okay? And the control is no longer mine. A dictator is one who tells me what I will do, and it gives up then my will, and it's a loss of my ability to choose freedom, which is agency. So addiction is actually a means by which I surrender my ability to choose or my freedom to choose and create then something else that is going to tell me what I have to do. Okay? When I was down in southeast Texas um, in the inner city of Houston, I, I had never seen or experienced people as a, a large population that were addicted and in the evening hours, just before dark, people would just come out of their homes with the most crazed looks in their eyes. And they were hooked on drugs, and it was, it was really a sad thing to see. I'd never witnessed or experienced that before. And to see them just searching for their next fix was so disheartening for me as a young person to, to just see that intensity with which they were looking for something to crave or pacify what they were being told they had to do, okay? So this dictation then, this control and loss of will and agency is actually then a counterfeit for real feeling. For example, when you look at addictions, they most often are utilizing our senses to counterfeit something else or a feeling, okay? Or in other words then, they're an attempt to counter or hide, most often, a hurt. Okay? So when we really get to the root of addiction, there most often is a fear. Okay? A fear of being found out. I'm not good enough. I'm not measuring up. I feel inadequate. I feel like I didn't measure up for dad, or I didn't measure up for mom, didn't measure up in the classroom. Or, it may be that I'm trying to hide, okay? One of the most common addictions that I see with young women has to do with an attempt to hide some type of a sexual trauma in childhood, okay? I've had a lot of girls come to me with eating disorders and with severe attempts at controlling their emotion or their fear out of pain. And so, when I start to see cutting, a lot of cutting on the arms and cutting on the legs, you're looking at some type of a sexual trauma, okay? And usually it has to do with an abuse in the childhood. Um, there, I've had several young ladies that have come to us that um, have had trusted family friends, um, <coughs> trusted neighbors who have committed some atrocities toward the young women. And when we actually start to get into it, when you look more closely and you see the scars that they're trying to create, what they're trying to control is their pain. And they're, the thing that they're trying to control is the emotion that starts to come up with that, and then they try to hide it or counterfeit it or control it again. Okay? So control 
is another means or directive of addiction. So think about it this way. How many of you, now don't raise hands of course, but how many are very, very in need, especially as mothers, to be in control of your home being neat? or not being able to interact or invite others into your home because of a fear that things might be perceived as being out of control. I need to be on time. Time can become an addiction, okay? Neatness or cleanliness can become an addiction. Trying to keep my kids with their perfect schedules can actually become a control issue, which really is very strongly linked to a fear and attempt to hide, okay? So oftentimes when we feel ourselves getting angry with our children, we may have to step back and just stop for a moment and ask God, what is it I'm afraid of? Show me my fear. Okay? Do you ever feel like, oh, I asked you a dozen times to get your room clean, or I've asked you a dozen times, I've told you a thousand times, I've, and we use those kinds of phrases and we find ourselves getting very irritated and angry with our kids, and yet if we could step back and compare it to one of our girlfriends. Ah, I wanted you to come over. Well, I don't feel that same rage when she's not on time. Okay? Ah, I thought you were going to come and be on time at this certain visit, or we were going to go out for a lunch date, or whatever the case may be. We have a lot more leniency with them, but with our own children, <coughs> we start to control in such a way that we're attempting to hide our fear. And if we can step back for just a moment and ask, what is it I'm afraid of? A lot of times we're trying to control something that has a rooted fear in something of, based of inadequacy or a past abuse. Okay? The closer that we get to that fear recognition, the more uncomfortable it is. Okay, so let me give you a couple of examples. Um, first of all, I worked with a, uh, a young man who... His parents had been divorced, and he was extremely addicted to pornography. He said on his days off, his mind was so controlled by pornography that seven times a day, he would find himself looking and viewing uh, pornography. And when he came to me, he said, I want to be free of this. I want to be able to have a day off where I feel like I've done something constructive. And when we went through all of the different counterfeits of what he was experiencing, he was actually looking for approval. And his approval wasn't met, and consequently he was looking for that approval in another manner or fashion. Okay? There is a Christian author named John Eldridge. And he has a series, a book series, and a... Um, a DVD series called Wild at Heart, and I think it's very, very helpful for men dealing with addiction and men dealing with primarily two addictions. First, John Eldridge says, every man has a question in his heart, and that question is, am I good enough? Okay, dad, am I good enough? Do I have what it takes? And our dads always say, no. Okay, it's not intentional because dad doesn't know how to answer the question. So where do men take their question? One of two places. Money and women. Okay? And in taking the, the question to those two sources, there becomes then more of an addiction or a commitment to work. And so men will work and accumulate this massive kingdom, if you will. Okay? I'm the biggest uh, rancher, I'm the biggest truck driver, I have the biggest truck driving company, I have the biggest snowmobile rental company, or whatever the case may be, and attempts to mass things and accumulate things with a sense of accomplishment. Finally, I've reached the top. Okay, But in that, it still feels empty. And so what does he also need to do? Conquer more women. And each woman that he conquers becomes just another notch in his belt. Well, if I could get her, then I could get her. If I could get her, then I could have her. And it becomes a very stuck high school mentality. Okay?